Well, um, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here at HSBC in Canary Wharf, and I'm very grateful to uh, HSBC for hosting me uh, this afternoon. Uh, the only downside is I'm conscious that holding this event in London risks feeding the prejudice that financial services is just a London business, when in fact, of course, it's a vibrant part of the economy across the length and breadth of Britain, with over two-thirds of financial services jobs outside London and significant financial services hubs in Edinburgh, Leeds, Bristol, Belfast, Birmingham, Bournemouth, to name but a few. On Friday, the Prime Minister set out the UK's vision for its future economic partnership with the European Union in a speech which answered the call to set out what we want. While being clear that we understand that this is a negotiation where both sides will need to give and take. As the Prime Minister said, our task, together with our European partners, is to deliver a Brexit that works for the UK and for the EU. A partnership that protects supply chains and established trade relationships, that backs businesses, safeguards jobs and promotes the shared European values that we all hold. And the first step will be delivering on the implementation period, which was agreed as a fundamental part of the deal on withdrawal issues that we did in December, and which we expect to be formalised at the March European Council meeting. This implementation period is essential if we, and by we I mean all of us, businesses and citizens across all 28 countries, are to benefit from a smooth pathway to a future partnership between the UK and the EU. Nowhere will this be more important than in financial services, where we must work together to avoid the potential risks to financial stability that could arise if we faced a cliff edge in March 2019. But for the implementation period to deliver the smooth transition we all want to see, it needs to be effective. That means our regulators working together so that businesses, especially regulated businesses, are able to plan on the basis of it, giving full and meaningful effect to what we agreed in December, delivering clarity and certainty to businesses and citizens across Europe. The Prime Minister was clear in her speech that after we've left the EU, we'll be outside the single market and the customs union, but equally, we'll be free to cooperate closely with partners, including the EU, where it is in our mutual interest to do so. Financial services is such an area where we can and should collaborate closely, recognising that a future economic partnership will always need to ensure a fair balance of the rights and obligations associated with market access. Today, I want to build on the vision the Prime Minister delivered on Friday. I want to explain why it makes sense for both the UK and the EU that we continue to collaborate closely on cross-border financial services. I want to challenge the assertion that financial services cannot be part of a free trade agreement to set out why it is in the interest of both the UK and the EU27 to ensure that EU businesses and citizens can continue to access the UK financial services hub, and how this is not a zero-sum game, where any loss of market share in London is automatically a gain to another EU capital. And I want to describe what a future financial services component of a comprehensive trade partnership agreement could look like. The UK Financial Services Hub is an engine that powers the real economy not just in the UK but right across Europe. Because the fact is that the UK Financial Services Hub is not just a British asset but a European asset too, supporting businesses, savers and citizens across the European Union, serving the whole of our continent and the world beyond and not just serving Europe, but powered by the talent of hundreds of thousands of Europeans who work in it. And it's an asset of un unparalleled in its history, its scale, its complexity, its agility, and its connectivity to the economies of Europe and the world. A global public good, as the IMF described it. 
EU passporting did not create the City of London, nor did some smart regulatory fix or government incentive. It is a combination of intangibles, language, legal system, time zone, culture, networks, risk appetite, regulatory approach, all blending together to create an ecosystem, an immensely potent combination of factors, impossible to replicate or perhaps even to map. Of course, having such a significant financial services industry brings to the UK huge benefits, but it is not cost-free. The UK economy bears the related risks and UK taxpayers stand behind those risks, as we learned to our very real cost during the financial crisis, when those taxpayers provided support to financial sector firms to the tune of £136 billion. And that's not a lesson that we will forget. So even as a member of the EU, we have chosen to go higher and faster on regulatory standards at times to protect our taxpayers. And because we understand the risks we are taking, our commitment to rigorous and robust regulation will remain undimmed. David Davis was right in Vienna when he said that Britain's plan is for a race to the top in global standards. And because those risks are so significant, it is vital that the citizens of any country bidding to take on a bigger share of Europe's financial services market have a full and transparent understanding of them. The deep pools of capital, specialist skill and regulatory competence in London provide efficient, safe and high quality services to the EU. We manage uh, 1.5 trillion euros of assets on behalf of EU clients. Around two thirds of debt and equity capital raised by EU corporates is facilitated by banks based in the UK. 78% of European FX trading and 74% of European interest rate derivatives trading takes place in the UK. These are services that businesses rely on to run their operations efficiently and with the benefit passed on to consumers in all 28 EU countries. And we should be under no illusion about the significant additional costs if this highly efficient market were to fragment. Costs that would be borne by Europe's businesses and consumers. Costs that industry bodies across Europe are beginning to recognise. The consultancy Oliver Wyman calculates that the wholesale banking industry would need to find between 30 and 50 billion US dollars of additional capital if new regulatory barriers forced fragmentation of firms' balance sheets. And London Stock Exchange Group estimate that the EU's proposal on location of clearing houses, if implemented, would increase costs to EU27 firms by around 25 billion US dollars a year by fragmenting the market and losing the efficiency of offsetting between trades. Already evidence is emerging of market, market actors reassessing their commitment to Europe in the face of potential regulatory fragmentation. For example, Intercontinental Exchange announced plans last month to launch daily gold futures contracts in the US next year, based on metal held in the UK. Those who think that the major winners from any fragmentation of London's markets would be Paris or Frankfurt or Dublin or Luxembourg should take note. The real beneficiaries are more likely to be New York, Singapore and Hong Kong, cutting Europe's market share and leaving Europe as a whole less competitive and more resilient on distant financial centres operating under very different rules. So it's time to address the sceptics who say that a trade deal including financial services cannot be done because it has never been done before. To them I say every trade deal the EU has ever done has been unique. The EU's never negotiated the same arrangements twice. It has bespoke relationships with Turkey, Canada, Singapore, Korea. Every FTA has varying degrees of market access depending on the countries involved, which is not surprising given the different economies and the different interests reflected in those agreements. 
In just the last hour or so, you'll have seen that the EU has published its draft negotiating guidelines. It is clear that a deal based wholly on precedent cannot deliver the depth and breadth of market access that these guidelines envisage. Because any trade deal between the UK and the EU must start from the reality of today, that our economies, including in financial services, are deeply interconnected, that our regulatory frameworks are effectively identical, that our supervisors and regulators work hand in glove to maintain the stability of our financial systems and have developed high levels of mutual trust, and that our businesses and citizens depend on cross-border financial services trade in their day-to-day -day lives far more than most of them will ever know when they buy a car or take out a fixed-rate loan or hedge their fuel costs or insure an aircraft hull. The EU itself pursued ambitious financial services cooperation in its proposals for TTIP, which it described as a partnership that would be more than a traditional free trade agreement. And in its initial proposals for CETA, we, we, we know about this because back then British and French officials worked hand in hand on the proposals with the Commission. Both CETA and TTIP were intended to promote convergence between entirely separate markets with different rules and low levels of interconnectedness. We can do much better, given our starting point. At the time of the TTIP negotiations, people rightly argued that this was a challenging objective, but it need not be so in a partnership between the UK and the EU because our markets are already so deeply interconnected. If it could be done with Canada or the USA, it could certainly be done with the UK. And there's another reason why it must be done. A trade deal will only happen if it is fair and balances the interests of both sides. Now, given the shape of the British economy and our trade balance with the EU27, it's hard to see how any deal that did not include services could look like a fair and balanced settlement. So I'm clear not only that it is possible to include financial services within a trade deal, but that it is very much in our mutual interest to do so. But in making that statement, I do not minimise the challenges. I recognise that there will be many legitimate concerns. Concerns about the policing of rules once we're separate legal jurisdictions. Concerns about the legal framework for regulatory and supervisory cooperation. Concerns about the implications for financial stability and for the operation of Eurozone monetary policy. We stand ready to engage on all of these issues and we've been giving a great deal of thought to how to address these concerns to ensure that all our economies continue to benefit rather than simply throwing in the towel and allowing the market to fragment to everybody's cost. I will set out our initial thinking, but first let me say a word or two about financial stability, because we've come a very long way since the autumn of 2008. Working collaboratively across the EU and indeed beyond with international partners, we've increased the capital requirements of our banks, we've tightened supervision of their operations, and we've put in place resolution plans to avoid contagion should the worst happen to an institution. In the UK, of course, we've gone further and ring-fenced the retail banking operations of integrated groups from their wholesale market activities. So the risk now to financial stability is not from continued close cooperation and integration. It is from the opposite, breaking up the intense cooperation that has developed between regulators across the EU and the UK. Modern Europe is quite literally testament to the benefits of tearing down walls. Let us not now propose new barriers where there need be none between our successfully collaborating financial services regulators. So building on the Prime Minister's speech last week, let's consider how we might structure a future partnership in financial services in a world beyond the single market and passporting a partnership that enables the ongoing delivery of cross-border financial services in both directions 
while protecting financial stability and consumers, businesses and taxpayers across the UK and EU. In my Mansion House speech last June, I set out three principles for a future partnership in financial services. A process for establishing regulatory requirements for cross-border trade between the UK and the EU. Cooperation arrangements that are reciprocal, reliable and that prioritise financial stability. And a legal framework that makes this structure durable and reliable for participants in the market and for businesses who use their services. Today I want to describe how the vision of the Prime Minister's speech could shape those principles into a framework that could be the basis of a future partnership in financial services as part of a wide-ranging free trade agreement. We will start from a unique position with full alignment on day one. The challenge is what happens next. So the way forward must surely be to bank our day one de facto equivalents and shape a regime to manage future regulatory change that ensures that while our rule systems may evolve separately, we deliver fully equivalent regulatory outcomes, maintaining commitments to support open markets and fair competition. As these rule systems for financial services evolve, the United Kingdom cannot simply be an automatic rule taker. Let me explain why. We've invested heavily in the current rule book and our industry is structured around it. And we hope very much that from day one, good sense, sound economics and a commitment to mutual benefit will be the guiding principle of future rulemaking on both sides, often within the framework of internationally agreed regulatory standards. But because of the size of the UK's financial services market, around 10 times our GDP, and the complexity of the products traded on it, and the consequent risks our taxpayers bear, we cannot sign up to automatically accept as yet unknown future rule changes. We must have the ability, if necessary, to deliver an equivalent outcome by different means. Maintaining our commitment to ensure access to each other's markets is on a fair and non-discriminatory basis, while protecting UK taxpayers from potentially unacceptable risks. Now, at first glance, this may appear to point to a solution based on the EU's established third country equivalence regime. But that regime would be wholly inadequate for the scale and complexity of the UK-EU financial services trade. It was never designed to carry such a load. The EU regime is unilateral and access can be withdrawn with little to no notice. Clearly, that is not a platform on which to base a multi-trillion pound trade relationship. But the principle of mutual recognition and reciprocal regulatory equivalence, provided it is objectively assessed with proper governance structures, dispute resolution mechanisms and sensible notice periods to market participants, clearly could provide an effective basis for such a partnership. And although we will be separate jurisdictions, we would need to maintain a structured regulatory dialogue to discuss new rules proposed by either side, building on our current unparalleled regulatory relationships to ensure that we deliver equivalent regulatory outcomes, agreeing mutually acceptable rule changes where possible and where rules do evolve differently, we will need an objective process to determine whether they provide sufficiently equivalent regulatory outcomes, including not only looking at the rules themselves, but also assessing the way in which they are enforced in a specific jurisdiction. Drawing on international standards where they exist or on additional principles for equivalence where the UK and EU have more developed rules. Second, there would need to be continued close supervisory cooperation. The EU itself noted in the context of TTIP discussions that in too many instances, international standards have been implemented in a way that does not allow the relevant regulators and supervisors to work together, weakening the resilience of financial markets. We must not risk exacerbating that tendency. 
So while the UK would cease to be a part of the EU's supervisory agencies, there is no reason why we could not maintain a very close working relationship. Indeed, it would be an essential part of supporting the regulatory equivalents that I have described. For instance, through proactive and extensive information exchange authorised by the data sharing agreements within the overarching FTA, going far beyond what is available in ordinary third country relationships. It could cover market abuse, transaction reporting and stability monitoring, as well as prudential concerns about individual firms. And it could involve a version of today's college structures covering both day-to-day -day supervision and resolution in crisis. Of course, how each party organises its internal governance would be a matter for it. Neither party would have a role in the other's governance processes. But we should be able to build on the extraordinary level of supervisory collaboration and trust that already exists between the EU and UK authorities to establish the most comprehensive supervisory cooperation arrangements anywhere in the world, protecting our respective financial systems and our taxpayers from instability risks. We recognise also that the supervision of major clearinghouses conducting euro-denominated activity is a particularly important and sensitive subject for our EU partners and we stand ready to discuss a mutually satisfactory way forward in this area. The supervisory cooperation that I've described does not involve either party transferring any responsibility for its rules or ceding any sovereignty. And that leads me to the third principle. As the Prime Minister said on Friday, in certain circumstances, we may choose not to maintain equivalent outcomes, but we will know that there may be consequences if we do so. We would have to address how this future partnership would work in such circumstances with clear institutional processes to do so. Our concern in a financial services partnership would be to ensure that any such consequences were reasonable and proportionate, applied in a predictable way that allows industry to plan with confidence and that they were delivered through an independent arbitration mechanism that has the confidence of both parties. Such mechanisms already exist within free trade agreements, including CETA. The Prime Minister was clear on Friday that we've decided to leave the EU and we accept that there will be consequences. We do not expect the same relationship we have today across all areas of activity in financial services. Trade-offs should be expected and the industry will change. But we should ensure that the future partnership strengthens European stability and prosperity rather than weakening it. The ideas I've set out today suggest a way to move forward, to shape a potential partnership in financial services based on the core concept of fair and non-discriminatory competition, recognising legitimate concerns where they exist but drawing a, a distinction between those concerns and protectionism or political expediency which would undermine that competition. What I've set out today is a possible route to a future partnership grounded in logic, pragmatism and compromise. A partnership that would protect Europe's financial stability and underpin one of its great competitive advantages. And I look forward to constructive engagement with our friends and partners in the EU to take these ideas forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take uh, some questions now and I'm going to go to Kamal Ahmed from the BBC first. Kamal. Thank you, Chancellor. Kamal Ahmed from the BBC. Uh, don't Donald Tusk's comments this morning show the huge gulf still between the European Union and the UK government? He talked about negative economic consequences. He talked about no pick and mix. And also, could you specifically respond to his comments about Theresa May? He characterised the Prime Minister's position as being political suggesting that Brexit would be a success at any price, 
And he went on to say that that is not the EU's objective. Well, let me, um, f first of all, I, I uh, didn't see the Donald Tusk appearance myself, so I've seen uh, reports of it, but obviously I've been travelling to get here. Um, uh, but the EU uh, is a very uh, skilled negotiator. They've done this many times, before, not, not precisely this, but they've negotiated uh, agreements with many countries. Uh, they're very skilled and very disciplined in the way they carry out their negotiation. And it doesn't surprise me remotely that what they've set out this morning uh, is a very tough uh, position. Uh, that's what any competent, skilled and experienced negotiator uh, would do. I expect that we will have a uh, deep uh, and constructive engagement with them uh, and I hope that what I've set out here this afternoon uh, will contribute uh, to the discussion that we'll be having. Um, Adam Parsons from Sky here. Adam. Uh, yeah, Adam Parsons from Sky News. Um, Chancellor, this city is full of nervous international financial institutions, probably including this one, who are mulling over moving headquarters and jobs to other countries. And the one thing they want is clarity over the future. And here you, you've told them exactly what they wanted to hear, except these are also the things that the EU has explicitly said it will not give you. You've now ruled out equivalents, which appeared to be the middle ground that lots of people would have accepted. What can you say right now to these international banks to persuade them not to move jobs and buildings out of the City of London? Well, I hope anybody won't be moving any buildings. That would be very dramatic. Um, uh, first of all, just to be clear, um, I haven't ruled out equivalence. What I've said is that the EU's model of equivalence, which is unilateral, uh, withdrawable on no notice in some cases, um, and isn't underpinned by a, a robust um, objective assessment structure, would not work. It was never designed to work for major uh, financial uh, market flows. It was, uh, it's something much less robust. Um, and, and what I've said explicitly this afternoon is that I think the principle of equivalence, if it's based on um, um, a mutual agreement, um, it's robust and enduring. It's underpinned by objective analysis of whether equivalence e exists in a given um, situation. And there are proper procedures, arbitration arrangements and notice under it could be uh, the basis on uh, which we could move forward. But let me deal um, with your, your specific um, question, because I, I, I understand the point. You're absolutely right. Um, and the key here is the implementation period, which we've been... Uh, talking about which we agreed with the EU as part of the December package and we, which we expect to get uh, confirmed formally in the European Council later uh, this month. That will assure businesses uh, that the deadline, if you like, the, the, the cliff edge has moved forward uh, 20, 21 months to the end of December uh, 2020, uh, allowing us time to take forward this negotiation uh, with our EU partners around all the complex areas of our future partnership. Um, Robert, Robert Pest, no, Robert. <coughs> Chancellor, uh, yeah, it's a slightly better day for me because I just might remember who I am and where I'm working. It's Robert Pest and ITV. Um, got it right. <laughs> um, the EU's negotiating guidelines today explicitly ruled out the kind of mutual recognition regime that the Prime Minister wants and which you have set out today for your financial services deal that you want. So why don't you just face up to reality, recognise that all they're prepared to do is a bog-standard, Canada-style free trade arrangement and get on with it? Uh, because I don't think that's the case, Robert. I think uh, if you read the, um, uh, the aspiration that the EU itself is setting out for our future relationship, it couldn't be contained within uh, a straightforward uh, FTA. Um, the EU itself has noted that because of the proximity uh, of, uh, of the UK and the European Union, because of the uh, complexity and scale of existing uh, trade flows, uh, in many respects, a, 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 a simple f um, free trade agreement uh, would leave many questions unresolved that would have to be resolved because the relationship between the UK and uh, European Union countries will never be the same as the relationship uh, between Canada and European Union countries because of the different nature of the trade. Um, 
nearly all of, or a very large proportion of our trade with the EU is row row uh, trade across the channel, whereas almost all of the trade between Canada and the EU will be containerized sea freight or air freight. It's a different type of trade. Uh, much of our uh, exports to the EU are intermediate goods going into complex uh, supply chains. Very different situation. Uh, and that's why we will need uh, a bespoke agreement. And I think it is not unreasonable to observe uh, that when we're doing something which is unique in the history uh, of world uh, trade arrangements, we're taking uh, a market which is highly integrated and we're moving it apart, we're separating it uh, apart uh, and trying to put in place uh, structures that will make that practical and workable. That is different from anything anybody's ever done uh, before in a trade agreement and suggesting that we use a bespoke uh, an off-the-shelf agreement that was designed to bring two distant markets closer together for this purpose um, is not really credible, I think. Um, Jason Groves from the Daily Mail. Right, Jason. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, you and your colleagues seem to be going to enormous efforts to keep things more or less exactly as they are. I wonder wh whether you think Brexit is worth it and how Britain will look different on the day after we leave. So... Um, I am addressing here this afternoon very specifically the circumstances of the financial services industry. It's Britain's largest uh, industry. Uh, it's uh, very important to us both economically and fiscally and it's an unprecedentedly integrated um, industry sector working across international boundaries not just into the EU 27 uh, but across the world. And what I've set out uh, is a uh, suggested uh, way forward, which is appropriate for the particular circumstances of uh, this very uh, unusual and specific um, industry. Um, the, the, the arrangements that I've talked about here wouldn't be appropriate for all other sectors of the economy. Uh, they are uh, appropriate, I'm suggesting, for the circumstances of the financial services industry. Um, Kate McCann from The Telegraph. Kate. The EU's negotiating guidelines demand reciprocal access to fishing waters after Brexit, but warn continuation of the current relationship in other areas would be unacceptable. So isn't this an example of cherry-picking? And wouldn't it be more honest to admit that this is the way all deals are thrashed out in the end? And if I may, is such access to British waters something that you would find acceptable? Uh, well, I think um, what you've highlighted again, and as I say, I haven't had a chance yet to read the EU guidelines for obvious reasons. Um, but it doesn't surprise me uh, that their position in their guidelines is we would like a great deal of the thing that the British will be reluctant to concede and very little at all on offer of the things that the British will regard as most important. That uh, is probably not a bad opening strategy for anyone engaged uh, in a negotiation process. So I do think you have to see this uh, as a negotiating um, strategy. Um, in terms of uh, fishing, fishing is an iconically um, important uh, British industry and we're very clear that we're taking control of, of our waters. But of course uh, we will be open to discussing with our EU partners about the appropriate arrangements for reciprocal access for our fishermen to EU waters and for EU fishermen to our waters. We'll have to negotiate the basis on which such an arrangement could be fair and appropriate for us. Uh, and finally, is Jess Schenkelman from Bloomberg here? Jess, yeah, hi. hi. Um, just going back to the beginning of your speech, when the transition is agreed this month, are you suggesting that regulators should get together to make it binding and legally secure for banks so they don't have to wait until the withdrawal deal is signed and sealed? Um, you, you seem to be suggesting that regulators could do something along those lines. I think the, the, the agreement that we reached uh, in December was to deliver an effective implementation deal um, in March. And that will require uh, the European Council to adopt the implementation deal in conclusions. Um, but that alone won't be quite enough because obviously there will be a process to be gone through of parliamentary um, ratification. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I think that there is a great deal that the um, Commission itself can do, uh, that uh, regulators can do to, to provide reassurance to businesses uh, across the European uh, Union, including 
here in London and of course many of the businesses here in London that are seeking reassurance are in fact EU uh, based businesses operating here uh, in London's financial services market. So we look forward um, to a cooperative uh, approach which ensures that the implementation period deal is not just delivered on paper but is, del is delivered in a way uh, that is usable and valuable to businesses so that they can plan around it and, and move ahead with their plans for the next uh, three odd years. Thank you very much.